My favorite part about the scientific endeavor is the naming and classifying of things. Scientists do this for all sorts of objects, minerals, elements, planets, even particles. But nowhere is this more evident than in the living world. Biologists have an entire branch of biology called taxonomy to do just that. Now, unfortunately for me and for you, the aspiring cataloger and taxonomist, very few resources cover all classifications. Take phyla, for example, the largest grouping system for the animal kingdom. Now, introductory biology textbooks will cover the major groups, sort of the broad overhaul, but will almost never go into the small, obscure, and very interesting minor phyla. Conversely, specialized resources, which may cover those small phyla in detail, almost never cover the broad whole. So we have ourselves a problem of reconciling the broad with the fine details in one resource. So to combat this, I present today my new series, Every Everything, which covers everything in a particular topic to resolve the broad and the details. Every animal phyla. So before we get too far into the weeds, let's make sure we're defining our terms here. What is an animal? Well, the actual word comes from the Latin animale, which means living being or being which breathes. But that's not particularly helpful, so let's dig more into better terminology. So an animal is a defined as a multicellular eukaryotic organism. Multicellular means it has more than one cell, unlike single-celled organisms. And it's also eukaryotic, which means good kernel. That means that its DNA, its genetic material, is contained in a membrane-bound nucleus. Now, there are multiple types of multicellular eukaryotic organisms, and animals are different from those other types, those other types you probably know more commonly as plants and fungi. Animals are characterized apart from plants and fungi by most notably mobility. They also don't have cell walls like most plants and fungi have. Now animals can be very diverse. They range from microscopic to macro, some of the largest thing, living things like whales. And they also range from very simple, essentially collections of cells that are loosely organized, like things like sponges, think of that, to very complex organ systems like we have in our own bodies. So with that, next, let's define our second term. What is a phylum? Well, it's a method of grouping in taxonomy found here among all the other types of groupings. The broadest grouping is life itself, all the way down the most specific is species. And these are the, the major groupings. Phylum here is directly under kingdom, so kingdom's very broad. We'll be just looking at the animal kingdom today, as opposed to things like the, an the plant kingdom, fungus, bacteria, etc. And so you can see phylum is directly under kingdom, so it's the broadest classification within kingdom. And then there are subsequent more specific classifications below. As an example, we have our species level here, a tiger. If we go up one to genera, we have a lion, so these are two closely related big cats. Moving up farther to family, Felidae, these are all cats. Moving even for, farther to order, we have carnivora, so we add a bear. If we want to go to class level, all mammals, we add our gorilla here. Even farther, we get our phylum chordata, all things with chordates. Farther out, we have the entire animal kingdom include non-chordates. Let's take a look at our list of animal phyla. Here are the 32 animal phyla in alphabetical order, but since I'll be going through this by size, starting from most species, the number, most number of species to the least, we'll switch it over here. So we have arthropod at number one, all the way down to 32 of micromathozoa. Now different resources have different numbers and compositions of phyla, because it's sort of a tricky business to figure 
these sort of things out. But that message aside, this is close enough. Now, this the resources I got from here had 32. Others have up to 35. Or, and other ones have just like different compositions. For example, the catalog of, catalog of life has also a 32, but they're different. They they uh, raise a cancel cephala, cephala and uh, sepunctula, so that's thorny headed and peanut worms as their own phyla, and they actually bunch uh, three phyla on my list here: the the Kinoranka, the Lorisophora, and the Preda pallida, into one combined phylum called the Cephalorinca. So that given that being said, we'll be considering these 32. And mostly this comes from this resource here, this paper, Phylogenetic Insights in Animal Evolution. The, the one kind of main difference here is they have sort of Brecopoda and Phoranida as sort of together. I'll be considering those two separately. And then additionally, they, they kind of have chordates out here as if they are three different phyla. We'll just be considering uh, chordata as their own thing here. And then one other final thing here, they have a thing called uh, Dicemidia, which isn't on this list, but it is another name for 26 year Rhombozoa. So just different names for it. All right. Now to get a comparison, because we're going by size, kind of going from the biggest to the smallest, let's look at some size comparisons of animal phyla. So I went kind of with the, if there is ambiguity in the, the number of species, I kind of just took this from the wiki, the wiki list just for simplicity. Though there are other uh, resources at, at the end for other size species estimates. Anyways, so I essentially made circles for each phyla and the size of the circles com compares to the number of species. So starting out here, by far and away, the largest is Arthropoda. In fact, I can't even fit the whole circle in here, otherwise the other ones will be crowded out. So Arthropods are this giant group. The next sort of grouping of the next largest ones you can see here are Mollusca, Chordata, so that's vertebrates including us, flatworms, nematodes, so roundworms, and segmented worms, Annelida. So you see here that the next biggest one compared to Arthropods are, is still actually quite small though there are a lot of species compared to other things. Okay, so then I sort of round out here are smaller groupings, Nideria, those are like jellyfish, peripheral spongers, echinoderms, and then we start to get into things you might never have heard before, bryozones, rotifers, uh, nemertia, tardigrades, etc. And even farther out, smaller sizes are many things you've probably never heard about unless you're a biologists and taxonomists enthusiast. And then finally, at the very end here, we have the very small, very obscure phyla all the way down to Micronathozoa. This tiny little dot you can probably barely see here represents a single species. So from a single species all the way to arthropods, which is in the mil um, over a million species. So that's the size range when it comes to the number of species that we're covering here. So therefore, let's dive right in to our biggest one, Arthropoda. So for each of these, I'll give a meaning, uh, another names, and then salient features, as well as examples for the, the major, the bigger groups that have a lot of representation. So arthropods, that means jointed foot. They're also known as arthropods uh, kind of as a class or as a, a phylum, they don't really have another common name. So there's 1.25 million species, which is a lot more undiscovered. They come in all sorts of environments, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. They have external skeletons composed of chitin, and they their segments, most notably, pa are paired jointed appendages on those segments. So they include things like insects, spiders, millipedes, crustaceans, other things like that, both the things you eat, like lobster, and the things you don't eat, but maybe your food like fish eat, things like copepods. And you can see here, these are another way to kind of show things out. Arthropods include 
the myropods, so millipedes, centipedes, trilobites, which are extinct. Chalicerae, those are spiders, horseshoe crabs, ticks, things like this, things you generally don't like. Crustaceans, things well, you either eat or your, your fish meal eats. And then insects. Okay, sliding along, we have mollusca. It means soft. They're also known just as mollusks. So there are 85,000 species. They are mostly marine and freshwater, though there are a few terrestrial. So think, think like snails and some slugs. So they're usually wholly or partially enclosed in a shell. You can see here, this is our body plans of different major mollusks. Most have external shells like gastropods like snails or uh, bivalves, though some have sort of internalized shells like octopus and squid. Now they have a distinct head, a visceral hump, a muscular foot, and bilateral symmetry. These include things like snails, slugs, clams, oysters, squids, octopuses, so a pretty wide gambit of things. Okay, bulking up here, we have the chordata, which means with a cord. So another way to say this is they're vertebrates and related relatives. There are 55,000 species, and they are in all sorts of environments, marine, freshwater, and terrestrial. So the, the big things that make them chordates, they have a nodal cord, which is a flexible supporting rod. They have a dorsal nerve cord, postanal tail, gill slit openings, and an endostyle. These include uh, a lot of things that are not quite vertebrates like we are. Vertebrates are the kind of the bulk of these, but there are also things that are close to vertebrates like lancets here, sea squirts, and lamprey. And then the actual vertebrates, which includes things like sharks, bony fish, and then what we would call tetrapods. So it involves amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So most of the things you think of as animals probably fall within chordatas, or at least on land that aren't animals that aren't insects. Flatting, flattening ourselves out here, we have the platyhelminthes, also known as flatworms, because it means flat worms. There are 30,000 species, marine, freshwater, terrestrial. Importantly for humans, many are parasites, which is why we care about and study a lot of them. They're soft, bilaterally symmetrical, non-segmented, and flattened bodies. They have really no specialized respiratory, skeletal, or circulatory systems. You can see a generalized form here. They do have, you know, nerves and a um, intestine, but not a lot more from there. Uh, most interesting, a lot of them will have these funny, almost like googly eye, like eye spots on more of the, the planarians. So they, they have that going for them. And another thing they, they don't have, they have no body cavity, all, all, also known as um, a coelom. That a lot of times is helpful to distinguish different worm-like things from each other. Now, some representative species are things like flukes, tapeworms, planarians, so the glue guy guys here, and monogenia, which don't really have a common name. Okay, rounding ourselves out, we have nematodas, which are mean thread-like, and so they're called roundworms. So these are 25,000 species. They're also found in a lot of different places, marine, freshwater, terrestrial. There's a lot of ones in the soil. This is a quick tour of the diversity. And see here that there's marine, estuary, a lot of soils, as well as plant and animal parasites. So that's why another reason we care about them, there's a lot of parasites, both for our crops and for ourselves and our our animal friends. So they're bilaterally, bilaterally symmetrical. They're elongate and they're usually tapered bodies. So they can have a taper at both ends. And then they don't quite have true um, coelums, but some have pseudo coelums. So they're pseudo coelomites. Some represented species, the most famous one is the model organism C. elegans, but there's also things like heartworms and guinea worms for parasites, and then root knot worms for plant parasites. So here we have a bunch of free living ones. They actually have really interesting mouth parts, a lot of the free living ones, and also the parasitic ones. So we got some here, and then here, here's a diagrams of like plant parasites feeding with these stylets on roots. And here are a couple of parasitic nematodes. Uh, most notably, I think this is Ascaris.
Okay here, worming our way along, we have analyta, which means little ring. These are also known as segmented worms. And when you think of worm, this is probably what you think of. Worm is a very general shape and a lot of things are worms, but this is probably the OG worm as it were. There are 22,000 species. They're marine, freshwater, and terrestrial, so they get around like all the other worms. Their bodies are divided into segments. Why are they called segmented worms? They have coelums as opposed to the pseudocelomite nematodes and the acelomite platyhelmets. And they have typically have movable uh, setae, which is essentially like bristles or hair-like things. You can see these are different body plans of different worms. You can see they're, they're bristly in all sorts of places. Representative species include our fabulous earthworms, including parasitic species like leeches, giant tube worms, ragworms, this is where like peanut worms fall into. Some other classifications make peanut worms their own phylum. We're considering them as uh, a uh, grouping of annelids. There's also crazy things like bobbit worms and even feather duster worms. Okay, simplifying things a little bit. Let's look at cnidaria. It means stinging nettle. And these are for a rather broad term, jellyfish. There are 16,000 species. They're mostly a marine. There, I think, are a few freshwater. But they, the big thing is they manufacture stinging capsules, also known as nematocysts. That's where they get the name from. They're not bilaterally, but radially symmetrical. And they have only two cell layers. So most animals have three cell layers, but the simpler ones, like Nidaria here, have two. They have no civilizations, so have no head, and they lack organs. They do have a polyp and medusa type lifestyle. And you can see here uh, the range of different types of jellyfish here, and then representative species down here. We have our sea anemones, our coral. They're Nidera, yes. There's box jellyfish, true jellyfish, man o' war, which actually is uh, a Nidarian and some other organisms living together. It's kind of complicated, interesting stuff that we'll gloss over. And then things like hydra, which are one of the freshwater representatives. Rito, keeping the theme of simplicity, we have periphera, meaning pore bearer, most commonly known as sponges. There are 11,000 species. They're mostly marine, a couple of freshwater. Again, they lack definitive nervous systems, true tissues, and true organs. These are one of the simplest animals. And like Nidera, they have two cell layers. And another big thing with them, they have a lack of conspicuous moment, movement. So here are a couple diagrams of different types of sponges. They essentially are filter feeders. And here are the major groupings. We have glass sponges, uh, calcarea sponges. Those are kind of minor wings. The major, most of sponges are these demo sponges. So if you go look at a coral reef with the coral and then all the sponges around, it's probably going to be a demo sponge if you see one. All sort of shapes, sizes, and colors. OK, let's get this next phylum under our skin, we have echinodermata. It means spiny skin. They don't really have a common alias, so they're just called echinoderms. There are 7.5 thousand species. They're exclusively marine. They have a hard spiny covering our skin. Five part radial symmetry, so that's kind of interesting here. We have generalized body plans here. We have these five part. A lot of times we'll have two feet. And then they have this water vascular system derived from the, the, the coelom. Representative species include sea lilies, sea urchins, sea dollars, sea cucumbers, starfish, and brittle stars. Branching out here to some more interesting forms, we have bryozoa, which means moss animal. And so they're known as moss animals. There's 6,000 species. They're mostly marine, some freshwater, however. And they are often colony forming. And a big thing with them is they contain a ring of ciliated tentacles, also known as lophophores. There's other phylum that have lophophores, but these are one of the main ones that do. This shows some more specialized taxonomy within it. And you see that um, bryozo are closely related to brachypoda and Foronida, and they're all in this kind of larger grouping, not not a phylum, but, but uh, called uh, Lophophora because they have those ciliated tentacles, as I said. So here here are some examples of marine ones. Let's see, and in fact, there's even some freshwater ones. Here's an example of freshwater one, and then 
here's some of the myriad forms that you can kind of find them in. Now, wheeling our way over, we have rotifer. That means wheelbearer. They're just known as rotifers, about 2,000 species, usually microscopic, and they're freshwater environments. There are a few marine, but unlike most exclusively aquatic species, these are predominant in fresh rather than marine. So they, are, they can be free swimming, anchored, or even parasitic. They have a thin cuticle body wall and then tufts of cilia at anterior end. So this is which make up the corona. That's sort of that wheel-like shape. They have a muscular pharynx containing small hard jaws. That's a mastix. That's how they eat their food. And some examples, here's, here's a couple more typical rotifers. They're, they're often the zooplankton at aquatic, base of aquatic food chains, especially in freshwater. And then in this classification are uh, thorny headed worms, which are parasitic shown here, are also pretty highly derived rotifers rather than their own phylum, acanthocephalopoda or cephalophylum, whatever. Um, okay. Keeping on, keeping on, we have Nemerta, which was the name of a, a sea myth in, I believe, Greek mythology. So they're known as ribbon worms because they kind of look like terrifying living ribbons. There are 1.2 thousand species, mainly marine, though all aquatic. They have a muscular irreversible proboscis. So here's a generalized version here where the proboscis and muscular can be adversed out of the body. It, has a, it does have a circular system and a gut with separate mouth and anus. So here's an example of one here. This is a illustration here of what's called a bootlace worm. It can be like yards long. It can be really large and crazy. And here's some different uh, il illustrations of types of worms here. You can see here they have very worm-like shape because they're worms, but they're not any of the more well-known types of worms like annelids or nematodes, they're their own phyla. Pondering our way on further, we have tardigrada, the tardigrades. It means slow step. They're also known as adorably as water bears or moss piglets. It's about 1,000 species. They are microscopic. They're found in terrestrial, freshwater, and marine environments, really found everywhere, but they're usually, if they're terrestrial, it's in damp environments, so often on moss, why they're called moss piglets. They have a fused body of four segments and eight legs. You can see sort of the microscope here, just the normal um, microscope, and then like electron microscope. So they have eight legs. They have a well-developed head region. They don't really have any specialized circulatory or respiratory organs. And they have a fluid-filled body cavity, which is called a hemocell. And you see in this sort of group here, they're closely related to these things, uh, the onco, Chophora, the, the velvet worms, and then which are all sort of eventually closely related to arthropods and then some extinct relatives here. So we can see sort of the progression or relationship. Okay, dusting off our hair shirt, we have the gastrorica. It means hairy stomach. They're funnily called the hairy bellies. There's 690 species. They're microscopic. They're in marine and freshwater environments. They're, they're covered in a cuticle that's often scaly and spiny. So here's a, a dry of them. You can see kind of very um, almost hairy. And here's representative sort of species. You can see they, they often sort of have like forked ends, but then almost always sort of hairy. And th they, they have a swollen and lobe-like head oftentimes. And these are pseudocelomates, sort of like the nematodes are, or some of the nematodes are. So there we go. Now, getting to the real weird stuff, we have Xena coelomorpha. It means strange hollow form. And they don't really have a common name at all, so I am going to come up with one of my own. I'm trademarking this one. These are the Xena worms. There are 400 species. They're in marine environments. They're biologically cynical and worm-shaped but they really lack a lot of common features in other bilateral uh, phyla. So they don't have an anus or excretory system or circular system. They just kind of look like a weird sort of strange worm. So yeah, xenoworm. And looking at some of the invertebrates, we kind of have them up here. 
they seem to kind of split off from bilatera as sort of one of the base of the bilaterans, where the, the other ones with bilateral symmetry are the sister clade. Next, stretching the bounds of biology, we have nematomorpha. The nematomorpha also means thread form. So these are the horsehair worms, also known as Gordian worms from the famous Gordian knot, so tangled up knot. So there are 320 species, the terrestrial slash freshwater. What I mean by that is the young, they're actually parasites of arthropods, so kind of the terrestrial version, while the adults are free living in water, usually kind of standing water. They have a very hair-like body form, shown by these kind of example species here. And they really, um, you can see like nematomorpha sounds a lot like nematode because they're, and they actually resemble nematodes a lot, but longer than any typical nematode has the right to be. And unsurprisingly, they're pretty closely related to nematodes. Okay, sticking out our arm or maybe our foot on the line here, we have brachypoda, means arm foot. These are also known as the lamp shells. There's about 300 species. They're exclusively marine. Their body is enclosed in a pair of shells. So again, this illustration here, we have the, the brachial or the dorsal shell, and then the the pedicle or the, the ventral shell. They have bilateral symmetry, they have a true coelom and a U-shaped gut. And most of them are filter feeders. We can see some example species here, one kind of with its arm foot out and other ones in a more natural sort of pose, as it were. Scuttling along on many feet, we have the Onychophora, known as the claw bearers, aka the velvet worms, because they're of a velvet-like cuticle. It's about 200 species. They are found in terrestrial environments. They have a pretty well-developed brain, nerve cord, segmented eyes, and respiratory system, etc. They're actually closely related to arthropods. You can see here's the sort of terrifying mouth here. They're all predators, but then um, they're closely related to arthropods like chelicerids, crustaceans, etc. though they have different uh, brain composition, different evolution that, you know, they eventually split off from the common ancestor of both of them. And a big thing that makes them different is they do have a pair of excretory organs on each leg bearing segment, which makes them kind of different. And yes, despite appearances, these are not millipedes or centipedes. Okay, here. We are going to the Entroprocta, which I, I can't really sugarcoat much. It means inside anus. So much nicer name is the goblet worms. Does it kind of look like goblets? That's a little more, a little, uh, a little less unsettling. There's about 150 species. They're mostly marine, though there are a few freshwater. They're mostly sessile, so they, they latch somewhere and just filter feed. They can grow singly, kind of like this microscopic version here, or in colonies, as we show here. And they have ciliated tentacles, shown here. And then the actual, the, why they're, where we get the name from is their anus is within the testicular ring. And these are closely related to bryozoans, which is why some groupings give bryozoans and enteroprocta as the same phylum, but we've split them out here. Okay, we have Kinorinka, which means motion snout, uh, with an alias, a name, common name, which is one of the best ever, is mud dragons. These are 150 species, they're microscopic, and they're found in marine environments, most notably silt, sediment, mud. That's why they're called mud dragons. They're scaly segmented and have a crown of curved spines, so the scalid, so that's what it's shown in this picture here. And their mouth is encircled by a ring of piercing stylets up here. So here's a microscope picture with a, a light microscope. Here's a scanning electron microscope. You can see them in all their mud dragon glory. Wouldn't want to run into this in a dark uh, mud pile, but they're microscopic, so no big deal. Okay, now we have the hemichordata. So there's chordata in the name, so it means, and hemi is half, so it means half chord. 
So these are also known as acorn worms, prefer the acorn-like head tip. They are in marine environments. They're biologically symmetrical and unsurprisingly worm-shaped. They have no central nervous system, and their body is broadly composed of a proboscis, that collar-like thing here, and a trunk. And then here's one in its native environment. And we can see here from this taxonomy that hemichordates are closely related to chordates, unsurprisingly. And while, though all chordates have a central nervous system here, the hemichordates really just have a nerve net. They have things like guts and gill slits, but not eyes like chordates tend to have. Okay, we have the Cheto Gnatha, the long hair jaw, what that means. They're also known as arrow worms because they look like worms if they were arrows. They are found in marine environments, biologically symmetrical and still worm shaped, but they have a head, trunk, and tail. So our head, our trunk, and then various versions of tail. They have a coelum, so they're coelomates, but with a non terminal anus which some people think they don't have an excretory system based on that, or a complete one. They do have a nervous system, however, but no circulatory or gas exchange systems. So they're usually fairly translucent, so we can see a couple here. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, getting wilder and weirder, we have the Larissifera, it means corset bearer. Um, they're known as brush heads, uh, sometimes all known as uh, girdle bearers, whatever. So there, there's 122 species. They're microscopic, as you can see by some species here on slides. Here's a sort of stylized illustration of it. They're bilaterally symmetrical. Their body composed of a head, neck, and trunk. The trunk region is surrounded by six plates that make up the, the girdle, as it were, or the corset. They, they actually have surprisingly well-developed nervous system and brain and nerve ganglia. And they're, they're probably most closely related to things like our, our mud dragons. Okay, now we have the gnat throstomulida, which means jaw orifice. So these are known as jaw worms. There's about 100 species. They're microscopic. So I have different ones shown on display here. And they're bilaterally symmetrical and worm-shaped, found in marine environments. They have no coelom, and they have a blind gut, so the, the gut doesn't go out anywhere. You, food goes in the mouth, and it goes back out the same way. So un, unpleasant eating, but for the jar worm, I guess it works. So it has a muscular pharynx with a pear jaw and basal plate. That's where we get the jaw from. And of course, th they've kind of been tricky to place. But um, one sort of recent paper has them sort of around the, the synodermata here, which is more closely related with mollusks. So they, they might be more closer in the mollusks than other phylum we've seen here. Okay, now we have the Cetenophora, which means comb bear. These are known as the comb jellies, which is confusing because there's the Cnidaria, which have the true jellyfish and box jellyfish, but these aren't these aren't these. These are their own phyla. It's about a hundred species. They're marine, biradially symmetrical, with a definite mesoderm. Though the big difference between this and jellyfish, they lacked stinging cells like true jellyfish, so they don't have this nemocysts. And they do have vertical ciliary combs on surface, so they kind of the comb. That's where the comb comes from. But if you're like, wait, weren't they just jellyfish? Worry not, these are very closely related to uh, Cnidaria, so true jellyfish and other things here. So whether you look at molecular comparisons, you have them side by side, or body plans that you have them side by side. So, so they're closely related if you were tricked into thinking these were actually true jellyfish. Going down the list into stranger and stranger forms, we have Rhombozoa. It means lozenge animal, because they're kind of shaped like lozenges apparently. And they have no common name, so I'm again going to trademark them as lozenge worms. Now, some of the classification for this is controversial, but we'll give it phyla status for now. They're found in marine environments, and 
They're very particular. They are parasites of cephalopod kidneys. So you can be excused for not knowing about these things unless you study cephalopod kidneys. They are the simplest bilateral invertebrate we phyla we know of. They only have, most of them only have 20 to 30 somatic cells. So here's some examples of them. They're very itty bitty. Here's kind of how they look like more diagrammically. And um, they, of course, parasitize cephalopods, so squids, octopus. And this is kind of where they find that they're probably most closely related to the orthonectida. Well, speaking of orthonectida, we have the orthonectida. It means straight swim. And they, again, have no common name, so I'm trademarking amoeba worms, because they kind of look like amoeba. They're microscopic. They're in marine environments. They are also very specific. They're ectoparasites, so uh, outward parasites, on marine invertebrates. They're biologically symmetrical and worm-shaped. And they have ciliate outer cells, so if you actually get microscopic versions, you can see that the little cilia in here is sort of illustrations. You see them very ciliated. They have no organs or tissues and no internal cavity, gut, or nervous system. So sort of like our lajin worms, they are very simple. Okay, getting into the questionable territory, we have the priapolida, which means little priapus. So not very original. It means, well, little it means a word that I don't really want to write or say here, but let's just say... um. Uh, Male reproductive organ worms would be one way to say this, or let's just go with even more abstract term, obelisk. They, these are obelisk worms, make of it as you will. There are about 20 species. They live in marine environments. They're biologically symmetrical, unsegment, unsegmented, though you can see from these species examples here, they have these things called annuals. So they're not true segments, but they're sort of like ridges on the outside. And they are worm shaped uh, they're also shaped like another thing um you know the 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 reference for an obelisk as it were so that's why they're called the things that they're called anyways they have an extendable spiny proboscis they kind of keep it in here and that is all we're going to say about them slipping along here we have the foronida its name is the name of Zeus's mistress. So talk about a string of um, awkward names here. They're also known as horseshoe worms, so let's go with that. There's about 11 species. They live in marine environments. They're worm-like worms with U-shaped guts and nerve, excretory, and reproductive organs. So fairly well advanced here. These are, again, those lophivores like our bryozoa and brachiopods and also hyoliths. They, they live in, they're pretty much sessile. They live in tubes secreted by special glands. So you can kind of see them hanging out here. Here's our stylized version here. And a uh, closer look at those lophophores, those protrusible feeding organs. Okay, we've made it to the placozoa, known as play animals. And again, they don't have a common name. So trademarking, these are the blob animals. Look at them here, look at them. So there are three species so far. They're microscopic. They're found in marine environments. And they're just two, very simple, two layers of single cells, just like sponges, just like cnidarians, so like jellyfish. So there's no symmetry or constant shape, no distinct tissues, organs, nervous system, coelom, or digestive cavity. They're just essentially blobs. These are probably the, the simplest animals, even simpler than sponges. So these are kind of the most basal primitive animal you can get and still be an animal. But we're not done here. We're going to keep going into even more obscure and small phyla. We have the cyclopleophora, which is wheel carrying. They don't have a common name. I've heard them known as lobster limpets, but I kind of like the term lobster lobe. So we're going to go with that. They're microscopic, found in marine environments. They are very, very specific, even more specific than those cephalopod kidney-loving parasites. These are attached to the bristles of lobsters. So you got the attachment here, very odd-looking things here. 
they have different life stages, this is sort of diagrams of them in more detail. They have bilateral symmetry, a U-shaped gut here, distinct head and trunk, and a, uh, the, the gut is through gut, so they have an anus. And here's some uh, scanning electron microscope versions of them on some lobster bristles. It gets even more obscure. We've come to the end. We have the micrognathozoa. These are tiny jaw animals. They have no common name, and unfortunately, jaw worms are already taken, so I'm going to call them Nash worms. My best made up name so far. There's a single species, they're microscopic, freshwater environment, they're bilaterally symmetrical, and unsurprisingly, worm shaped, like all the sort of different phylums of worms. We've got worms for days. They are acelomites, so they have no coelom, no body cavity. Their body is composed of a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They have a fairly, fairly complicated, they have a nervous system with a brain, through gut and musculature, though they don't have circulatory or gaseous exchange system, and they have a unique complex jaw system. So we have a picture of them in full here and here, but then here's some sweet pictures of the jaw. So the scan electric electron microscope, you see this jaw, so the diagram, like that's just crazy. I think they've earned their title of Nash worm just, just perfect. Hot dang on a stick, we've made it through. Now all the pictures or diagrams, a lot of them are free open source, but the ones that um, needed attribution, I have in our reference here, list here, as well as information you can find. I use a lot of uh, Britannica for some of the, the baseline things. Moving on here, there are even more references. And one thing I really want to note, a particular website I found really helpful is earthlife.net for especially some of the more obscure phyla. Well, 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 we did it, didn't we? Thanks for joining me on this whirlwind tour of every animal phylum. What was your favorite phylum? Leave it in the comments below. And lastly, stay safe from any mud dragons or gnashworms by bracing yourself for awesome.